So welcome, good listeners, to another edition of our monthly astronomy magazine, Starry Skies. I'm Mark Hardacre. And I'm Steve Tonkin. Today we're going to go through some of the things that you can see up in the starry skies of May, uh, including planets and the constellations. And now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, don't know really. Well, we're going to we're going to show you how to find some galaxies if you've got a really get yourself a really nice dark sky. What's a galaxy? A galaxy. Well, they used to be called island universes. They looked like these fuzzy patches, and they couldn't figure out whether they were part of our local neck or whether they were these distant places. And what they are is they're places that are millions of light years away. Right. That's, so that means it takes light m- millions of years to get here from them. Anyway, and you we'll come to that later when we'll, we get we'll, to... And they, uh, but they're just, just literally hundreds of billions, not millions, billions of stars. That's a hundred billion is one with... A billion is nine. 11, that is so 11, 11 zeros. zeros yeah. One with 11 zero stars. That's and some of them have even more than that. A trillion, one with 12 zeros. Well, you won't be able to see those with your naked eye in uh, May, but... We've got quite a lot going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been a rotten month, though, again, for weather, hasn't it? Oh, yes. Well, you know, this is astronomy in Britain. You've got to grab your chance when you can. Dear me. Yeah, we've had rain yeah, through the month of March. We've had rain and cloud and wind uh, through April. Let's just hope that May's a bit better, shall we? Indeed. So let's kick off. Let's have a look at the planets. What's going on with the planets this month? Again, not a great month for planets, is it, really? Well, it depends when you get up. Yeah, Um, that's true. (laughs) But uh, for the evening, well, we've still got Venus, which is just so obvious. It's the brightest thing in the night sky apart from the moon, um, which is we're now going to see in the west. And but also Mars, the red planet, it's getting dimmer, but it is still up there in the night sky. And you can see it. The easiest time to see it, actually, is going to be on the 8th, because if you can find the twins, Castor and Pollux, in uh, constellation of Gemini, Mars is going to be just below Pollux. So we have this nice little extra red star in the constellation of Ger- Gemini. And it, it's fading, isn't it? As we get oh, further is, yes. and further away from uh, Mars, it's yeah. nothing like it was as, when it was uh, bright and shiny and red in December. Is no, it? it doesn't look as red when it's fading either. Yeah, not enough light to stimulate yeah. it. The eyes. But how about Venus? I mean, that's, that is unmissable, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, if you've got binoculars, have a look on the... On the ninth, Venus, and just sort of scan around, and you'll see a little fuzzy patch, which is a thing called an open cluster, which is a cluster of young stars recently formed. And this particular one is sometimes called the Queen of Clusters. Um, M35 from Mess- Charles Messier's uh, catalogue of things that don't bother looking at because they're not comets, uh, <laughs> is what he invented it for. Yeah. Um, but this is M35, it's this lovely little star cluster. And, and Venus will be near there on what day was it? That's, the, that's the 9th. On the 9th of May. But, right. uh, you know, you can look a few days either side of that as well. Yeah. And also, as Venus moves further and further from the sun, uh, it doesn't even set before midnight. No. Which is very unusual, isn't it? It's mm. for, for Venus to be visible in the night sky all the way through midnight uh, through May, it's, uh, it's really quite unusual. It is, but it's because the line that, on which the planets sit, which is something called the ecliptic, in the evenings in May, and, and particularly late evenings, is very, very steeped. So things get very, very far from the horizon, which is yeah. why it doesn't set so easily. In the morning, it's completely different, because you'll find a lot of places saying that um, you know, around about the end of the month, have a look for uh, Mercury, because it'll be quite far from the sun, but because this line, the ecliptic, is such a, makes such a shallow angle with the horizon in the morning, it'll hardly be above the horizon when we, the, the dawn sky is brightening, so it's going to be extremely difficult to see. So we can really write off Mercury uh, I during the I think we month. can write off Mercury. But there's another one you can do with Mars, actually, and that is on the 24th. Um, the moon and Mars are going to be very close together in the constellation of Cancer, and again, 
Have a look with binoculars, because I think the moonlight will wash it out if you, uh, for naked eye. There's this little cloud, I think we mentioned it last month, Nephelion, M44, the beehive cluster. And Mars and the moon will be just to the right-hand side of that. So you can have a look for that in... Uh, on the 24th. And we won't be having Mars for much longer either. It gets closer and closer to the sun and we're going to lose it through we're, the summer, aren't we? We're going to lose, we are definitely going to lose it fairly soon, yes. Yeah. And we'll, we'll still see it through next month, June as well, but yeah. uh, not easily. But in, to compensate for that, uh, from the other side of the sky, we're going to start to see Jupiter, which is, of course, the biggest planet. Mm. And right now, um, Jupiter is pretty close to the sun it was uh, behind the sun as seen from earth last month and it's mm -hmm. only slowly moving into the morning sky yeah but for all those early risers those of you getting up and driving maybe through the forest eastward mm -hmm. you might just see at the end of the month a bright yellowish star down low uh, on the horizon and that is uh, jupiter it's going to be yeah. super during the uh, late summer autumn time but uh, at this moment in May, we can only just about see it uh, in the at the very end of the month. Yeah, from from about mid month onwards, it's, uh, it's so it's rising in the morning twilight. But you're going to need a fairly a fairly high um, vantage point to see it on a low eastern horizon. Yeah, I was just thinking, you're driving across the A31, uh, listening to Forest <laughs> FM very early in the morning. Well, it have to be very early in the morning. Indeed, it's like, yeah. Four o'clock or five thirty. There is actually a few lovely places if you're if you're driving that way. If you're going across the New Forest on Roger Penny Way, there's a few places you could put you can pull in and have a look towards the east, and you've got a beautiful vista um, over it's over Southampton, and you but you could still see yeah. uh, Jupiter rising through that. Absolutely gorgeous. And the, the planet, as far as I recall, is in the constellation of Pisces. Uh, which is a fairly dim constellation. Mm. You can't really pick it out too well. And I believe on the 17th of the month, uh, Jupiter will be pretty close to the thin moon. Still. Yes, so you, it's going to be lo lovely to see. It's going to be very, very thin crescent moon. Now, this is... Uh, which means that the the sun's almost lighting the back of the moon, just a little bit ra sunlight coming around the edge. So it's quite close to the sun, or appears quite close to the sun and the two will be together in the morning sky. If you want to try and take a photograph of that, do that and uh, you know, show us what you get. Yeah, that'd be fun. And taking pictures, we'll probably talk about that next month, of how, yeah. to, how to do some astrophotography, basic stuff. Uh, it's a great way to use your, even your iPhone uh, with small telescopes. You can actually take pictures yeah. uh, of the stars and planets. Let's talk about that next month, shall Let's we? do that, yeah. Great. Last planet that uh, is really visible is the lovely ringed planet Saturn. And mm. like Jupiter, is just emerging from the sun's glare. Mm. Um, it's in the constellation of Aquarius, which is the one next to Pisces in the sky. And again, not... Uh, very, very glamorous at this time. Uh, it's not very bright in the sky. You can catch it in the early morning. Um, the rings are closing up. Uh, so so what, what does that mean, Mark? Well, they, it, everybody knows, I think, that Saturn is the, the ringed planet. It's the one with the brightest rings anyway. Um, and as Saturn rotates around the sun, from our viewpoint, the rings appear to open up wide so you can see them um, at, a, at, a, at a wide angle to us, and then they uh, rotate during the course of several years until they become very thin and hardly visible. Mm. That changes the brightness of the planet or the, the appearance of the planet. And in the next two to three years, uh, the rings are going to get thinner and thinner, and Saturn, therefore, becomes dimmer and dimmer. Mm. I remember that, yes, Galileo observed that happening, and... Um, Smart guy, for him, yeah, for, for him, um, Saturn also represented Kronos, and in um, in Greek mythology, Kronos ate his children. Did he really? It, he he did indeed. And you can Sa always and re rely on Steve Tonkin to bring up <laughs> but, some. But I didn't know that. But, That's but, bizarre. But, but Galileo, you see, don't when, try this at home, yeah, listeners. No. But what 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 Galileo saw when he he didn't realise it was rings. He thought it was. Um, you know, a, a small planet either side or a small oh, moon right. either side of Saturn because of the not very good quality optics. And he actually penned down when, 
when they disappeared. He said, he just wrote down, in jest, has Kronos eaten his children? <laughs> As the ring. I never knew that. You learn something every day. Anyway, just to finish off with the solar system, the last two gas giants, that's Uranus and Neptune, not even no, visible this month. No, forget we'll it. We'll talk about those another month. Yeah. So let's move along. Let's, uh, let's talk about some constellations. And our constellation of this month is the very well-known uh, Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. Um, we, of course, all know it as the Plough here in the UK. Mm. Well, the Plough's only the little bit. It's basically its hindquarters and its tail. That's it. Not that you've ever seen a bear with a long tail, because <laughs> bears have very short tails. But That's there's true. A, <laughs> Um, but that that comes out in the mythology of it, where I mean, one of them, for example, um, we, the humans, were hunting the bears, and they went to the great god Manitou and said, you know, can you save us from these children, uh, these humans? So he picked them up by the tail, swung them around his head, and threw them into the sky. And that's why they've got a big, big long tail. That's why they've got long tails. You know, really, uh, the mythology surrounding the constellations, it's a delight to read. And there are several websites uh, that you can look at to, yeah. to investigate the mythology behind these constellations. And uh, Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, is, is, a, is one of those original 48 constellations that was listed by uh, the um, Egyptian astronomer Ptolemy in the second century. So um, it's it's well known to us as the plough, the seven bright stars, but actually the constellation is very large, isn't it, Steve? Oh, it is. It's it's one of the biggest ones. I think it's I think it's about the third biggest, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, and yeah, it's but most mostly we just see those seven bright stars and we forget about the rest of it. Yeah. And there's such a lot to see in the in that constellation. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the most well known in the UK. We call it the plough here. Americans call it the Big Dipper, but there are other names as well, right? Oh, it's the, the Ladle, which is like a Big Dipper. Yep. Um, and also to the ancient Greeks, that little bit, that the bit that we call the plough, just the tail and the hindquarters, was also known as the wagon. So if you look at it, it's like got, got a like sort of bowl, which is where the um, where the people or the goods would be, and a shaft that the beasts of burden, whether be they horses or oxen be yoked to, to to pull it so that was there and they had this um thing if you wanted to get to the pillars of heracles which is what they call called gibraltar you must keep the wagon on your right in other words if you want to go east if you want to go west you keep north on your right that's it's it. always to the north and that's a good thing as well that the plow which again most of us can find in the the night sky uh, helps us to find north doesn't it yep so, yes, so you go now go not from the tail end, you go to the other end of the bowl of the plough. And the last two stars there, Merak and Dube, they're called, um, they sometimes called the pointers because they point to the north star. And if you take five times the distance between them and you ca carry on that same direction, you get to a not very bright star. Pole star isn't that bright, but it's important because it's always over the north point on the horizon. All the other stars seem to go around it. Yeah. If you're not sure how far that is, spread your hand as wide as you can. Um, so and it's the same distance as your thumb to your little finger, just about. So we can always find the plough in the sky, can't we? It's called a circumpolar constellation. It is, but it can be quite tricky at the other time of the year, um, in, in autumn. So we can talk about how to find north there if it's stuck behind trees. But we'll leave that until yeah. um, October-ish. But right now, in May, the best time to go see the plough is go into your garden on these warm, balmy evenings, mm. take your lawn deck chair, put your head back, and look directly overhead, and that's where you'll find the plough. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't wait until it's warm. I mean, No, I can't. <laughs> it, it, this has been such a long winter, hasn't it? Yeah. Awful. But um, we're also uh, going to put a little map up of it. Yes, that's what we thought we'd do uh, for this month, is on the fan page for Forest FM. We're going to put a little star chart uh, that will help you to find other constellations using the plough mm. as a pointer, uh, to find the pole star, and also some of the other objects that are in this constellation mm. of uh, Ursa Major. And, and forget the plow is only, don't forget the plough is only one tiny little bit yeah. of, uh, of the great bear. Before we do that though, if you take the arc of the tail, and you arc, follow that arc down, 
and you come to a very, very bright yellowish-looking star. That arc leads to Arcturus, the star Arcturus, which is actually the brightest star in the northern hemisphere of the sky. Yep, and you can't miss it as well. It's due south mm. in May. Uh, so it, it's in the early part of the evening, it would be towards the the southeast, but mm. uh, around 10, 11, 12 o'clock midnight, if you look south, yeah. uh, high in the sky, you'll see this bright, yellowy, orangey star, and that's, uh, that's Arcturus. Yeah. The other, the other star that I think is really interesting is the sixth star along. So counting from the pointers, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way back, you come to Mizar, M-I-Z-A-R. Mizar used to be, for the ancient astronomers, an eye test, didn't it? Why Indeed. is that? Indeed. Up, well, up until Herr Schnellen made his eye test chart, you know, one with the decreasing sign of letters on, this was how they would test if your eyes were any good. You go out without your glasses, obviously, and have a look at Mizar and count the number of stars you can see. If you can see one, you need glasses. If you can see two, your eyesight's all right. Yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you, without glasses, I only see a blur. I can't see my eyes as a double. Oh, same, With my yeah. glasses, I can see it as a double to the naked mm. eye. But very interestingly, um, that double... Um, combination Mizar its companion is called Alcor mm. and they're separated by really quite a quite a, a reasonable distance you can easily see it with the naked eye but if you take a telescope to this double star combination you will see that Mizar itself is also a double star and mm. if you have a very very powerful telescope or a spectroscope you will see that each of the two double stars is also a double star, <laughs> which is utterly confusing. But that means that there are six stars here in this uh, group. Um, and again, we'll put a little diagram of yeah. that on the website. But six stars all physically attached to each other by gravity and orbiting around each other in a period of days, months and centuries. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating part of the sky. And you can see, even with binoculars, you can sometimes pick up the third star in that little grouping. Yes. That. So you don't need a powerful telescope yeah. at all. There are other things you can pick up in uh, binoculars in that part of the sky as well, because there's lots of galaxies up there. Ah, those, uh, these are, these these island universes. Island again. universes. The ones, now, yes. don't expect to see the sort of thing you see with... Um, in Hubble Space Telescope images or something like that. Long exposure photography. To the, to the eye and binoculars, they look like just these little misty patches, yeah. which is why, of course, um, Charles Messier thought they could be mistaken for comets, So he, because that's what comets look like as well, little misty patches when, they, when they're first discovered. And the reason that we can see them in Ursa Major is because Ursa Major is not in our galactic plane so we don't have all the dust and all the other bright stars around we're looking outwards from the plane of the galaxy yeah. uh, our galaxy the milky way up straight out uh, towards these other galaxies that's yeah. right isn't it it is but there's four little galaxies there that are relatively easy to find right. because we can use the stars of Ursa Major as pointers to them, but you are going to need a very clear moonless night to be able to do it yeah. and let your eyes adapt for about 20 minutes. So oh, we'll, first one yeah. is you go, if you take the, the end star of the pointers and you go diagonally across to the other side of the, of the, bowl, of the bowl of the plough, then so you go from the other side of the bowl of the plough to the end star of the pointers, and then the same distance further on that diagonal, there's two little fuzzy blobs there, one of which is actually quite easy to see, and that's M81 and M82, Bode's Nebula and the Cigar Galaxy. Cigar Galaxy is a bit trickier, yeah. but you can pick that up. And we go to the other end. So we've talked about Mizar and Alcor. You use that as the top of the... Um, upright of an um, uppercase capital letter L, with the last star being at the bottom of that, and then at the foot of that L, the other end of the crossbar at the foot of the L, there's another little galaxy, which is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Again, just make it out in binoculars. And then the last one is one that people find quite 
difficult because they try to look for it in cheap telescopes. And it's rubbish in cheap telescopes. It's actually easier in cheap binoculars. Yes. So you take those two stars again, and you imagine they're the base of an equilateral triangle. And then just inside the third apex is the very, very faint... It's quite big as well, so it's, it's, sometimes it looks just like a brightening of the sky, and that's Messier 101, sometimes called the Pinwheel Galaxy. Right. But then there are three galaxies at least called the Pinwheel Galaxy. Right. So, you know. <laughs> it's confusing. But you could see these, you know, you're looking at light that left, you know, bef before, long before your Homo sapiens. You know, we're going back to when we're sort of Australopithecus or even before that. So you know, it's ancient yeah. light. Ancient light arriving. It's, as you can obviously tell, it's not easy on radio to describe where these things are, no. which is why we've decided to put a little map uh, on the uh, Forest FM uh, website. You'll see that uh, in the next couple of days uh, to find these objects. So once again, we've got um, the four bright Messier objects to find, M81 and M82, uh, to the, um, let's call it the right of the constellation of, uh, of Ursa Major, and M51 and M101 to the left. Tail, You'll see that. Yeah. And uh, super little galaxies they are. Uh, bigger telescopes will show them in much greater detail, but uh, certainly with a pair of binoculars, you can definitely see them. Hmm. Super. So... Um, what else we got going on this month? Um, we have still the tail end of a meteor shower called the Lyrids, but I think uh, during the month of May they will uh, disappear. We'll not be yeah. seeing them. But um, there are some meteor showers coming up in the summer. We'll talk about them as we get into uh, July and August. But you can always just put your lawn deck chair back, rest your head, look up in the sky, and... During the months of uh, May, April, May, June, you will see the occasional meteor flashing by. So mm. keep your eye open for that. And don't forget, of course, the International Space Station, uh, which will pass overhead uh, mm. many times during these uh, next few days. And as well, Mr. Elon Musk's um, Starlink satellites, which you can't fail to see in these... Uh, uh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we have mixed views about uh, Mr. Elon and his and his satellites, but for astronomers, they certainly are a pain in the backside because they uh, cross our uh, images of the stars all the time, ruining in the images. Mm. But, uh, anyway, that's a story in, for you another. Know, that's, that's another sort of that's light pollution story, we should be yeah, dealing right. with. So, um, I think we're about done for the month. Uh, don't forget, if you are interested in astronomy, we have two great astronomical societies here in our radio listening area. We have uh, the Falling Bridge Astronomers. We meet um, in Ringwood on the third Wednesday of every month. And the Wessex Astronomical Society. Which meets in the Allendale Centre in Wimborne on the first Tuesday of every month. And both those societies are filled with people desperate, willing to help you out with your questions about what to see in the sky, uh, how to find objects, which equipment to buy, and anything else. We love to meet uh, you. We'd love to uh, especially meet younger people and get them interested in this fascinating hobby. Indeed. And again, we thank Forest FM for uh, all their support for our hobby. Um, and we'll see you next month. Yeah. Goodbye and keep looking up. Indeed, clear skies, everybody.